Praise God. I, I'm going to be a little pastoral tonight, which so I'm not going to be expounding on doctrine so much as I'm going to, I'm going to use the Word of God, but I'm going to talk to you about living for God, okay? From the Word of God, of course. So it's more pastoral tonight than it is, amen, you know, the oneness of God or Jesus in baptism. And I'm just going to talk to you, okay? In life, we are confronted with a variety of things. But what, what I'm saying in life, there are so many different issues that you and I will deal with. We'll deal with birth and death and struggles and troubles and, you know, just, just a whole myriad of things we'll be confronted with. Hallelujah. And, uh, and that's normal. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that's normal. Everybody here has family. You've experienced death. You've, you've experienced excitement and birth. And then, and uh, so we got all these things that we deal with in life. Hallelujah. I'd like us to go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 tonight. If you just let me talk to you from Romans 12, I'm, I'm not going to be real fancy tonight. Okay, I probably won't tell you something you didn't already know, amen, but if you just would hang out with me and agree with me, hallelujah. The, the apostle Peter, if you look at his epistle, you will see that a number of times he uses the word remember, and we have to be reminded, do we not? You know, we, we remind our children all the time, don't we? And we have to be reminded, I have to be reminded, so help me, I can preach one Sunday about overcoming trials, and, and the next day, man, just be so stinking depressed about whatever I'm dealing with. <laughs> and it's like, did you not hear what you said yesterday? Well, that was under the Holy Ghost. I don't feel under the Holy Ghost right now. <laughs> and, you know, come on. Come on. You know, you just... We, 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 we're in a war. And you don't get to sit on the sidelines and observe. Amen. And the enemy, you're not dealing with an enemy that's, you know, some people paint the devil, and I'm not here to glorify him, but they paint him as, as stupid and ignorant. He is not. In fact, even when the angels of God contended for the body of Moses, you know what they said? They didn't get into this, amen, you know, calling them names. They said, the Lord rebuke you. Because they understood his place of authority and what he can do. Amen. And one thing you need to understand, I hate him. But I also respect my enemy in a sense of what he can do. He's just like, I hate a rattlesnake. You know, I kill it if it gets close to me from long distance. I shoot it with a twenty-two. And, uh, but I also respect it. If I see one on a path or on the road, I'm not going to get out of my car and take a stick and start playing with the thing because I'm smart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I went to the zoo with my kids last week and, uh, they went to the reptile house. I just sat outside. I got no interest in seeing those snakes. Anything that relates to the devil, I want nothing to do with. No, snakes are not of the devil, but if you've ever read Genesis 3, you know, they were used by the devil. So anyways, so now. So again, we, we struggle, we, we fight a lot of things. But the Bible gives us a balance of how you and I are to react in every situation, not just some situations, but every situation. And in some situations, we do quite well. In others, we just, we nosedive right into the pavement. You know, we get, we got road burn, rash on us from sliding. Amen. So let's go to verse one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, okay, that you present your bodies as a Living sacrifice. Let me just stop there. Just going to make some comments here. The basis of what we're going to talk about tonight is based on verse 1 here of chapter 12. 
if we cannot dedicate ourselves to our God, if we cannot consecrate our bodies, which includes our mind, everything that we are to God, everything else that I'm going to say is just going to go, going to mean nothing. So the first thing that I have to do as a child of God is I need to make a decisive dedication to serve the Lord. Amen. Not, not just, you know, God, so help me. I, I know who I was many years ago. God would move on me in a Sunday. And I see, I see the game being played in this house. And I, 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 maybe that's too flippant. But I see people that will come to the altar and cry. And then the rest of the week, they live like the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a decisive dedication to God. And I know that because that's how I, what I used to practice. God would move upon me to bring me to change. But then I'd walk out of this place, and I really had not dedicated myself to my God. So the first thing you've got to do, if you're going to follow God, is it, you have to make up your mind, as Joshua said, who you are going to serve. All right? That's just basic stuff I'm telling you right now. you got to make up your mind who you're going to serve. Praise God. And and if it's an issue to you tonight, what I'm going to say tonight from the Word of God is you're going to have issues with it. Amen. The Bible says that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. Amen. They appear to him as to be foolish. Okay. And so, again, so... Paul writes, and he begs the believers of Rome, amen, to make that decisive dedication to present themselves as a living sacrifice, holy, and the Bible says, acceptable or well-pleasing to God. Everybody say well-pleasing. Hallelujah. That's what you should pray every week, or excuse me, every day. God, I want to be well-pleasing to you. I don't know where I'm going to go on Sunday. I told Sister Tammy and I, you know, I didn't send her, I, I didn't send in my uh, my voice, my lesson for, uh, I didn't submit it, Sister Ginger, Sister Tammy. And I just told Sister Tammy, and I, I have no clue what I'm going to talk about on Sunday morning. I really don't have, but, but we'll have something. By Sunday, amen, God will give us something to talk to the adult Bible study about. But at this moment, I, I don't have anything. Got a lot of stuff going on upstairs in my brain, but don't have anything. I, I, I do believe I know what I'm going to talk about on Sunday in, in the service. And it will definitely have some connection to what we're speaking about here. And amen. But it'll be in the area of submission. Amen. And, and so, but anyways... So I must submit myself to my God, amen, what's well-pleasing to him, not what's well-pleasing to Mark. What's well-pleasing to Mark is to go to Sheryl's and have hot fudge Sundays and, amen, and just, amen, walk around and read books and, you know, and, and, and you know what? And, and the guy really, if you want to know the truth, it'd be very easy for him to be a hermit and not interact with people at all because you, you just give me a book. And, 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 and I can go off somewhere, and you will not see me for a long time. I, I, in fact, you will not see me until I've read the entire book. So, I, I, you know, there's, there's things that I, I have to, uh, you know, is, is that necessarily well pleasing for me not to be in, influential in, in people's lives? And No, I, I have to break out of a mold that I could fit into real easy. Are you all, are you all with me? And, and I'm not retired, but you retire, folks. You, know, you don't retire from the service of God. I, I'm just telling you, you don't retire from the service of God. That, you, don't get to, you don't get out of this thing. You, you, get, you get more time, amen, but you don't get to retire from the service of God. And that's not a, I'm not trying to down anybody tonight. I'm just, amen, that, if the Lord tarries long enough, I may, I may get, get to see it from that side, Brother Williams. Maybe. All right. Tells us in verse 2. That we are not to conform to this world, and we heard we heard a lot about it uh, over the weekend with brother. Then brother East really talked to us. It was so good. I, I enjoyed sitting. I gentlemen, I got to sit in with the ladies. I got to do something you guys didn't get to do. Ha ha ha! 
But I'm going to tell you some. It was much like what he spoke to the men. It had, it had its different, different things that he said, but it, it was good. Amen. And then I got to be with the young people, and then I got to hear him on, on Sunday, a wonderful man of God. Okay. Do you, do you understand tonight, brothers and sisters, that the world is trying to force you into a mold? Do you understand that? Do you understand that the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more, the more, they're going to try to force us into their mold, to their way of thinking, amen, and we're going to be considered intolerant, bigoted, and, and whatever other names they can call us, you know, they can call us, they, in fact, they already call us a lot of names, but we, you know, if I say something about somebody else, I can get in trouble. I, I can get in trouble for, uh, uh, what's that uh, speech? Uh, hate speech. But you, you, can hate, you can hate believers all day. You can say all kinds of nasty things about believers. It's never classified as hate speech. So I am not going to fit into my world. But here's the problem. I associate with my world every day. If you watch television, if you sit down and you watch all those stinking programs and, and, you know, well, I'm not asking you to raise your hand tonight, but do you understand in almost every, and, and I, I haven't done any research, which means I haven't sat in front and watched to see for myself, but in every program, there is some kind of a gay couple. That, that, that's, that, that's not by accident, ladies and gentlemen. That's just, that, that is, there's intent behind that. What you must understand, just as God has an agenda, so does our enemy. And so do those, amen, that want the freedom to live any way they choose to live. And so that's the kind of world I live in. Amen. It rubs off on me just as it rubbed off on Lot. The Bible says that Lot was vexed every day by what he saw going on in Sodom. But here's what we got to do. It says, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. I got to renew my mind every day. I really do. I've got to fix my attention on God. Hallelujah. 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 Because if I don't fix my attention on God, my world will drag me down to a level of immaturity in God. Do you understand tonight, the longer you walk with God, the more you ought to be able to stay on your feet? Do you understand that the more you get in the Word and pray, amen, the more balanced you ought to be in your walk? You shouldn't get crazy. You really shouldn't. The more balanced you get, the more adjusted you get to serving God. Hallelujah. But this world that causes to be dragged off into immaturity, and I'll act like a little child. I've got three little children with me, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Well, let me see here. I'm enjoying most minutes of it. But I told one of them yesterday, and I won't tell you which one. It ain't about you. We're not doing it just because you want to do that. That's selfish. Life is about serving. And I'm talking to kids here, okay? It really is. Boy, I just feel it now. Mom and dad, if you don't teach your children to serve, you're doing them a disservice. Because, amen, to not serve is to focus upon yourself, and then it's all about me. Hallelujah. I just love my brats. No, don't you call them brats. I can do that because I'm their grandfather. All right. And I love you too. And some of you adults act like brats too. We, we cannot allow ourselves to go back to how we were. Do you remember how your life was before Jesus? It was only about you. Only about you. How everything fitted into your world. What, what it brought to you. Serving God is not like that at all. 
What can I do for you, Jesus? You see, I have given myself to you. I am that living sacrifice. It ain't about me no more. My God. You know, we, we, we wouldn't have any trouble in this body if everybody would just present themselves as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Not one problem. Hallelujah. All right, all right. But we will because we're people. But I'm just telling you, I'm just being pastoral right now. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just being pastoral. And then he says in verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. All right? But to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. In other words, you see, when I am not sacrificing myself to my God, I get this exaggerated opinion of my importance. And so do you. When you are not surrendering to God, when you are not sacrificing, giving yourself as a living, you get an exaggerated opinion of yourself. May, may I say this tonight? I, just hang out with me. I, I, I say this a lot in the jail. Maybe they understand it better than you do. But let me just tell you, God, God is a, he's an eternity, okay? There is no ends to God. Amen. The lion doesn't have, the lion doesn't have a mark. It's not a line segment. I really did learn something in school. It's not a line segment. God has no points on either end. It's infinite. Okay? We are finite. We, ha we are aligned. We got a date of birth and date of death. Now, I, I, I'm, it's going to upset some of you folks. Yeah, yeah. God loves us. He loves us. But you know what? He's not real concerned about your comfort in this thing. Oh, you thought he was? You thought all he wanted you to have was a bed of ease? He's not real concerned about this. He's concerned about this. And so he will do what he has to do to get us here. That's the truth. <clears throat> well, I came to God because I wanted it easy. Well, I can't help with your disillusion tonight. It don't work like that. We're not home yet. We're on our way home. And when we get there, we will have hot foot Sundays and read books all day. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, I'm back. I'm back. I just, I had a moment there. God forgive me for those moments. Okay. But the basis, the basis of relationship problem within the body is simply this. You think highly of yourself more than you think of somebody else. And you've got an exaggerated opinion about yourself. Are you all hearing me? That's, that's the bottom line. You think you're the most important thing on the planet. Well, I ain't. Turn your name and say, you ain't. But I love you. God's the most important thing. And so what I have to do, I have to measure myself by my sacrifice, amen, giving myself to God and remind myself that I really don't matter. That he matters, what he wants, what pleases him is of utmost importance. Amen. Hallelujah. In fact, if, if you were to, if you realize, man, I, I could slip right into talking about wisdom in James chapter 3 with where I'm at right now. But I'm not going to, I've been there, done that. Got my t-shirt. I know that's old and everybody else has said it, but I finally had to say it. All right, now, we're going to jump from verse 3 down to verse 9. We're not going to do, deal with ministry and service, amen, tonight. We're, gonna, we're just dealing with other things. And so, he begins to give us how I must be on the basis of, of my giving myself as a sacrifice to God. So he says to us in verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Ladies and gentlemen, our love for one another must be 
real. And it must be sincere. Turn your neighbor and say, real and sincere. I- I'm serious. Hallelujah. One of the things that has always made me uncomfortable is when I'm in this body and there's somebody that is sort of standing on the peripheral edge of it, and you get a couple people talking about where they're going to go have dinner or what they're going to do, and they're talking, and here's this person all by themselves just standing there. And in, on the inside, I'm just cringing. You know, I, I personally don't care if you all get together, you know, and get, but whatever you do, always listen and look around to see. If you really so- love somebody, you're, you're not going to try to hurt their feelings. I've hurt my wife's feelings more than once. More times than I care to remember. D- baby, if I've hurt your feelings today, forgive me. Because if I did it today, it was in ignorance. And I can be pretty ignorant. I know you're never in- ignorant, Monty. I know you never have any of those moments. Bless your heart. Now, when I love somebody, that doesn't mean that I can't have discussion and disagreement with them. Okay? There's nothing wrong with discussion and disagreement, but it must be with the basis of love and the basis of having surrendered myself and becoming this sacrifice, this living sacrifice that is Pleasing God. Hallelujah. All right, let me move on here. So I can't love without, I, I, can, I can't love with hypocrisy. I must have the real thing. And then he says, a poor what is Man, this is just all kinds of little, you could, you could spend lots of time in this, but I, I'm not going to do that tonight. A poor what is evil. Everybody say a poor what is evil. Amen. One, one of the most powerful stories to me is Joseph. Down the land, don't belong there. He's a worshiper of Jehovah, Yahweh, loving God. Sold by his brothers. Amen. He's down there, Potiphar's house. He's a, he's a handsome young man. And Potiphar's wife is a fox. She's a fox. And she's been pack, practicing her trade a long time. And uh, she tries to seduce him. Isn't that true? Can you not read that in the Word of God? It's there. She tries to seduce him, and he, and he, and he makes this powerful statement to her. How can I do this wickedness, not against Potiphar, not against her, not against his parents, but against his God? You see, he, he believed that when he was alone, God was still in the house. Some of us don't live like that. When we're alone, we, we just... but. You gotta pour what's evil. You gotta have a loathing for what is evil. Man, just 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 Barnett theology tonight. The Bible says that that Job abhorred evil. You ever read that in Job one? I'm here to tell you, it's no wonder that Saint couldn't get through to him. God had hedged him in. Why? Because Job thought like God did. He abhorred evil. God says, I'm protecting this man. So, if you're having troubles, you need to go back and see what you abhor. Maybe you don't loathe sin. I almost loathe liver. My wife loves liver. Liver smells good with bacon and onions, but I've been deceived a couple times, and you ain't deceiving me no more. No more. I don't care how good it smells. I loathe liver. I don't want it in my mouth. I had to eat it when I was a kid because life wasn't about me. And my mama would put some on my plate. Moms, she would put some on my plate and tell me I had to eat it. She didn't give me the big slab, but she gave me some. And so help me, I'd sit there and I'd ask for more mashed potatoes because I was trying to get mashed potato and a little bit of liver and slide it down my throat without any taste at all. And I'm here to tell you, it never worked. It never worked. I loathe liver. Well, how, how about sin? How about sin? How about evil? How do we feel about that stuff? Do we loathe that or, or would just, just let me 
hang out by the tree a little bit. Let me talk to Satan. Maybe he'll just say something, then I can blame him. The devil made me do it. No, it's because you didn't loathe evil. You sort of like it. You sort of like it. Remember, I'm talking about being a living sacrifice right now. You see, if you're not a living sacrifice, you're going to have a problem with evil because you're not going to loathe it. Do you understand it's evil that put Jesus on the cross? My sins put him on the cross. All the evil I'd ever done, it nailed him to a tree. It caused him to suffer. So I need to loathe evil. I said, everybody say loathe evil. And then it says to cling to what is good. I need to hold fast to what is good. Turn to your neighbor and just grab him in a hug. If you got a neighbor close. Hold fast to him. Ain't that sweet? That's sweet. You know, you can be a child of God and have a good time. We need to hold fast to what is good. We need to be involved in good things. Good things. Then let's move on. Because it goes right back and it says, be kindly affectionate, verse 10, to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Okay? In honor, giving preference to one another. We all got opinions. And your opinion matters. But when you won't let anybody else get a word in otherwise, you need to go back and give yourself as a living sacrifice. Because other opinion, people's opinions do matter. You know, and, and, and I'm not always right. Surprising. My wife is right sometimes too. All right, she's right more times than not. Just good insight. And there's times she tells me things, and I say, oh, baby, I, just, I, I don't say, keep it to yourself, sweetheart. Because that got me. That hit me. And I got them all over it, but, you know. But the Bible tells us to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. We need to honor one another. You are precious people. Every one of us. I, see, I, one of the things, sweetheart, you missed it. You missed it on Friday night because Brother, brother East, I mean, he ended up having young and old. He had very young children and very 19-year-old kids young people, men, young men and women. And so it's a hard age when you got, but the thing he, he left us with is that you have value. You have value. You really do. Ask mama what that means when you go home. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let, let, let me just, you know, I, I'm, I'm pastoring tonight, okay? Let me just say to you, before you correct somebody else's kids in this body, you need to know their name. And before you correct somebody else's kids, about at least uh, one time, at least I'll rub the top of their head. At least that's what I do. If the only words they ever get from you is sit down, shut up, and be quiet, you're never going to influence them. But if you've taken the time just to talk to him for a moment, I, I could tell you about the young man, his name is Eugene. At the age of nine, he, he walked in the doors of this house, sat on this side with his brother. There was a man, a friend of mine that was here. He was in his early 20s. I was trying to deal with him. I was hoping he'd go to the altar. He wouldn't go. This nine-year-old boy came to me and said, I want to get to Holy Ghost. Would you pray with me? He said, yeah, yeah, kid. Just go on down the altar. Go on down the altar. And, and I don't think he ever went down the altar. And now he's 18 years of age, and his mama's calling me, and he's been in prison. 18, been in prison. And his life is messed up now. And will be messed up the entire... And I think back, he was nine years old. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I got this, this adult over here is much more important than he is. There's some things you wish you could do over again. And that's one of the things I wish, I regret that. So, honor, young and old alike, all right? All right, we're down to verse 11. I'm getting somewhere. I got to get done here. And then it says, not lagging in diligence, okay? Not lagging indiligence you know I, I always like the enthusiasm of those that come to God 
It really, I get excited, man. They just, they're so pumped. Filled with zeal. Well, I don't know what happens to us when you've been in the kingdom of God for so long. But sometimes we lose that zeal. I think it's connected with what is written to us in Revelations when the church of Ephesus says you have left your first love. I think, I think that first love and zeal are somehow connected together. Okay? And so as believers, Paul tells them, not lagging in diligence, okay? Not lagging in your zeal. Amen. Then it says, fervent in spirit, burning in spirit. My God, some of you tonight were burning in spirit when you come into this house. And it affected me. I felt it. I felt it in this house tonight. Burning, amen, in spirit. Alive to God. Hallelujah. And that's how we ought to be. When you're living sacrifice and you're close to God, you ought to be burning in the spirit. Alive. In God. Dead to yourself. Dead to yourself. Dead to yourself. All right, all right, all right. All right. Serving the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about, serving the Lord. Let me throw this at you. Learn to play second fiddle. Has, has anybody here enjoy uh, like uh, the harmo the weather? You go to the. I want to. Yeah, sympathy. Yeah, <laughs> symphony. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My sympathy if you go to the symphony. All right, no, no, I'm not. Uh, it is. I enjoy good music, and I have listened to just people playing. In harmony together. I even like John Philip Sousa. You ever, you know who he is? All that, man, I just, there's some stuff, man, you know. You know what you got to learn to, you know, you know what you got to learn if you're going to play in a band? You got to learn that you're not, you may not be number one. You may be second, okay? But do you know second also has a part? Not just number one. Amen. Second also has a part. And so, brothers and sisters, as we walk with God, as we're serving the Lord, as we're honoring one another, we ought to be able to be second fiddle because we're all playing together and making wonderful music. I, I just had to come back to that. All right, here we go. He says in verse 12, rejoicing in hope. It's every rejoicing in hope. What hope do we have? Well, not on this world. But we have the, it tells us in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, that we are looking for our blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? The glorious returning of Jesus Christ. Does anybody believe he's coming back? He's coming back. It ain't going to be long. It ain't going to be long. While we're singing this song, <laughs> yeah, we'll be gone. Hallelujah. Now, where's I going to get any better? I know that. I'm not being a pessimist. I realize what's happening in my day. I know that America is not going to go back to righteousness as a nation. But it doesn't mean that we can't be righteous. It doesn't even mean we can't have revival in this day. But with the world going south, I'm rejoicing in my hope. Hallelujah. The return of the Lord. All right, so. This is all connected, man. This is all connected. And then he says, be patient in tribulation or steadfast in your troubles and your suffering. If you think you're going to go to heaven without any scars on you, you don't have a clue. I, uh, I have a series at home that I've watched many times. And... Uh, it's called The Winds of War. I am just fascinated with, with that time period in World War II, and my parents lived through that. My uncles were both in, one was in the Pacific and one was in Italy, and uh, just fascinated with that. And, and there's this scene where 
where the Ark Royal, I think it is, a battleship, it's got Churchill on it, and it comes cruising in this bay, and, and Churchill and, and our president, uh, Roosevelt, are going to meet. And when it's coming in, there's these, these Navy uh, officers, and they're observing, because it has just come from a battle with the battleship Bismarck. All right? Been in a battle with Bismarck, a, a powerful dreadnought of Germany. And it was sunk. And, they, and they're commenting on it. Well, they could see the scars of battle on it. But when it comes in, there ain't coming in. There was tail hanging down and it's heading. It's coming in proud. Ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot hold up under trouble, you're, you're going to have some trouble. If you can't deal with suffering, the Bible says to be patient in tribulation, be steadfast. I'm not changing because things don't go right. You hear me? I've been in a lot of battles, ladies and gentlemen, and I've gone through those periods when I thought the end was here for the church. I've gone through those ups and downs. I know what it is. It's affected my personal family. But I've learned one thing, just be steadfast. Didn't say I like trouble, but I'm going to be steadfast. I know we can suffer. My dear wife suffers every day. Do you think that makes me feel good? To hear her groan while she's sleeping? To hear her try to get out of bed and hear the stuff that she has? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not looking for your sympathy. I'm just telling you, this is life on this planet. Be patient. Be patient, steadfast in your trouble. Don't blame God for everything that comes your way. That's so immature. So immature. My God. Hallelujah. Just be. You, you never know who's looking at you. You never know who's watching to see if you'll fold like a cheap table. You don't know. Somebody observing you. Amen. And saying, my I thought he lived for God or she lived for God. Man, look what happened. As soon as trouble came their way, man, they just, they, they waved the white flag and whine and carry on. No, can't do that. Do I feel good? No. I serve a great God, though. He never failed me, Bertha. My sister, he's never failed me one time. Have I always got what I wanted? Well, of course not. Because then I'd be stinking selfish. All right, so be patient in tribulation. And then it tells us here, he's just given us a lot of instruction here. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Never stop praying. The moment you stop praying is the moment you start sliding backwards. The moment you stop praying is the moment that your thinking gets askewed. The moment you stop praying is the moment that your flesh begins to dominate how you live and how you think. So never stop praying. Continue steadfast in prayer. Hallelujah. In fact, when pray the harder. There are times, and I can only talk about me, other times I've just grown. I don't have nothing else. I go, oh God, oh God. I just groan as, as my spirit is feeling the weight of what we deal with. I just groan. Sometimes, uh, you know, I pray pretty loud. I, I didn't used to do that. It's like a lot of you sissy babies out there, afraid to lift my voice. Oh, I'm, I'm pastoring tonight, and, and, and if I've offended you, I'm not even going to say it. But there's times that I'm just, I'm praying and I just, I don't feel like letting y'all hear me. I just, oh God, oh God. When, when people fail God, I don't feel good about it. When people do immoral things, I don't feel good about it. When people that are supposed to be believers act out of sort, lose it and act like every other heathen out there, I don't feel good about it. It don't, it don't make me feel good. And I groan. Oh God. Oh God. I've got nothing to say right now, God. I just, I don't know what you feel, but I know what I feel right now. Pray harder, ladies and gentlemen. 
Let me, let me move on here. All right. Then at verse 14, here we go. Got to run through this quickly. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, if you have not, if you have not presented yourself as a living sacrifice to God, this verse rubs you wrong. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not curse. I missed, I missed it verse, didn't I? Distributing to the needs of the saints, verse 13. Given to hospitality. You need to be helpful to one another. I'm, okay, I'm moving on. Now I'm back, I'm back to bless those who persecute you and bless and do not. I'm sorry, I missed verse 13. It's important, but I, I just missed it. Then it says, and rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is just what we deal with. Huh? We, we can rejoice. We can, we can weep as they grieve. We can, you see, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. If you're not affected by what happens to other believers, within, then you don't really honor other believers or love other believers. It ought to have some kind of effect on you. Let me, let me just read to you different perspectives here. I got this today, so I, let me read it to you. A man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person walked by and said, it's logical that someone would fall down there. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how deep the pit was. A news reporter wanted the exclusive story on the pit. An IRS agent asked if he was, if he was paying taxes on the pit. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. A fire and brimstone preacher said, you deserved your pit. A psychologist noted, your mother and father are to blame for you being in the pit. A self-esteem a self -esteem therapist said, believe in yourself and you can get out of the pit. A optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist claimed, things will get worse. And Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen. It's exciting. Tiana had a little boy. Weep with those that this week are grieving the loss of someone they love. That's how we ought to be. And then it goes on, says in verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. And again, it's going back and coupling up with verse 3. Be of the same mind to one another. Do not set your mind on things high, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Hallelujah. Let me put it like this to you. Don't. I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> When in trouble, go back to the original. All right. Let's see here. Oh, okay, okay. Verse 17. It says, this, repay no one evil for evil. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. Turn your neighbor and say, you're beautiful. Don't ever shave. No, don't say that part. You're beautiful. Is, is this okay? Hallelujah. Don't hit anybody. Don't hit back. That's what little kids do. Don't hit back. Find beauty. Discover beauty in everyone. Okay? Have a good regard for the good things in the sight of all men. And then it says in verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Every relationship is a triangle. Here's your responsibility to have a relationship with God. Okay? You are responsible for that. This is not an option. You must have a relationship with God. And then this is also not an option. You must also have a relationship with your brother. And that's so it's a relationship with God. 
and a relationship with your brother. You must have a relationship with God and then a relationship with your brother. And it is your responsibility. This is, these are not options. Now, here's what causes the breakdown in relationship. If you quit praying, you're not going to treat brother right. Okay? And if you quit praying, you're not going to treat brother more right. And so in every situation, your responsibility, again, is to pray and do good to that other individual. Now, you can, now either one of you could do that. You could, you could pray, do good, and still get a bad response from that person. Okay? When you get the bad response, it tells you one thing. Herein is the problem. We're not, they're not praying. The relationship with God is not right. Herein is the problem. It's, it's not here. It's here. Because you see, if we're in relationship with God, if we're praying and we're submitting ourselves, we're not going to have a problem with our brother. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's, that's a fact. And that works like that in a marriage. If only one partner's praying in the marriage, you have problems. When you're both praying, you can solve any situation. Any situation. Hallelujah. And that's how it is. That's what, so he goes on and says, if it is possible, it just depends on you live peace with all men. So understand this, ladies and gentlemen. You can do good, you can be right, and still have people that have issues with you. You just make sure that you've done everything right. Check yourself with God. Make sure you're right with God, that you've done everything you can, amen, to make sure that that relationship is good. But there's always that possibility that they're just not going to surrender to God. And then you've got to deal with it. And you don't deal with it with how it says in the next verse, Beloved, do not avenge yourself. we we'll rather give place to wrath for his written vengeance is mine. I will pay, says the Lord. Now hear me. If you give wrath, if you give wrath to a situation, you know what happens? God steps away from it. He says, you've already given to him. I'm not dealing with it. You hear me? So I'm not dealing with it. I'm not dealing with it. You've already exploded on them, reamed them out, done whatever you had to do. You've given, you've vented your wrath upon them. God steps back and says, I'm done with it. All right? In other words, when I, when I treat people right and I get a bad response from them, what I am simply doing then is leaving the way open for God's wrath to operate. But if I vent my wrath on them, God says, that's it. All right, I'm done. And then he says, verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. In other words, surprise your enemy with goodness. Okay, and then the last verse, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. None of this works if you will not present yourself as a living sacrifice to God. And so guess what? If you're having relationship problems tonight, the first thing you ought to do is hit your knees and say, God, I got to get right with you. I got to surrender myself to you. Wait a minute. They're, they're the one that the, you surrender yourself they go, yeah, they're the one that did wrong to me. Surrender yourself to God. Humble yourself. And the scripture says, he will exalt you. Not over your neighbor. He'll exalt you by lifting you up into his presence. Hallelujah. That's how it works. Okay, let's stand tonight. Just a little pastoring tonight. Help me to do this, Jesus. It's easy for me to teach in this area. I got to practice it. So do you. Let's just reach out to him in closing tonight. Help me, Father, to love my brothers and sisters. 
to not think so high of myself that I lord over them, God. That's not what you call me to do, God. You have called me to be a living sacrifice. You have called me to submit myself and surrender myself to you. You have called me, God, to renew my mind. So I do not think like my world around me. i got to fix my attention on you, God. Hallelujah. You've called me, God, to love my brothers and sisters with real sincere love, God. You've called me to loathe and hate evil, God, and to hold fast to that which is good. You've, oh God, have called me to be kindly affectionate, amen, and filled with zeal, amen, and a burning spirit of love and serving you, God, rejoicing in hope and being patient in tribulation and continuing steadfast in prayer. That's what you've called me to. You've called me, oh God, to be aware of the needs of my brothers and sisters and to be given to hospitality. We didn't talk about that, but given to hospitality, God. We need to bless those who bless us. We need to, cur- we need to bless those who persecute us. And we need to bless and do not curse. We need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's what we're supposed to do, God. Oh God, oh God. Help me never to repay evil for evil. That's not how I'm supposed to do. Help me, O God, to keep my relationship with you strong and grow. Bless my brothers and sisters tonight in the name of Jesus. Help us, God. The the most difficult thing we will do tonight is is live up to what this word says, what this book says. This will be the most difficult thing we will have to do is walk in his word because that's what he requires of us. You want to know what God requires? He requires that you walk in his word. That's what he requires. So help me, God, to live your word tonight, to live it, to do it, to practice it, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, help me, God, to serve you, to live for you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God.